Welcome to Unit 2, The Media of Art, Lesson 12, Sculpture. The term sculpture describes artworks that occupy space. These artworks are created through a number of processes. Three basic categories of sculpting are modeling, casting, and carving. Each category is discussed in this chapter along with more contemporary types of sculpture such as kinetic, assemblage, and installation. Descriptions of many of these media and examples are explored to reveal their individual characteristics. The objectives for this lesson are to distinguish sculptures as three-dimensional art that viewers examine from multiple perspectives. Compare examples of freestanding and relief sculpture. Describe additive, subtractive, and constructive techniques used to make sculpture. Identify materials used in sculpture, including kinetic and mixed media works. And discuss the use of installation and site-specific art to transform their surroundings. The outline for this lesson, the subjects we'll be covering are freestanding and relief sculpture, methods and materials, modeling, casting, carving, constructing and assembling, kinetic sculpture, mixed media, and installations and site-specific art. Before we get into the methods and materials of how certain types of sculptures are made, we'll discuss a few varieties of sculpture, namely freestanding and relief sculpture. Freestanding sculpture is meant to be seen from all sides. It is also called sculpture in the round. Relief sculpture is sculpture that projects from a background surface, similar to a quarter or a nickel. Most coins are all in relief. The sculpture is by Martin Purier, titled CFAO. This is an example of freestanding sculpture or sculpture in the round, meaning that it's intended to be viewed from multiple different angles, depending on how the gallery is set up for the access to the particular piece visually. Now we are limited by this class and in the format that we're in that we only have photographs to look at. So these are all going to be, so to say, different angles of the object that you're going to have to kind of imagine, of course, how this would be by seeing the front and the back of the image if experiencing it in the round. Sculptors do have an advantage, actually, when they're applying for museum shows and gallery shows that a traditional painter, photographer, only gets to send in typically one example of each work in order to translate visually what you may experience in looking at a freestanding sculpture. Usually they get to submit three to ten slides per object or sculpture for a gallery show or museum show they may be applying for. This is also an example of a mixed media sculpture that there are many different things in here from the wheelbarrow, the implied African mask that you see in the back view, and all the intertwining pieces of wood. This is a Greek silver coin of Apollo from around 415 BCE. This is an excellent example of what a sculpture in relief looks like. You have your image raised from the surface when you rub your fingers across it. You would feel bumps. You would be able to make out the general characteristics of the sculpture. Now, coins have a specific type of relief. It's called low relief. We will be discussing two different types of relief, low and high relief sculpture. Here is another slide of a relief sculpture, a low relief sculpture. It's Army on the March. It's a relief from the Angkor Wat Temple in Cambodia. It's roughly from about a thousand years later than the coin that we looked at from Greece. You can look at low relief sculpture as a more illustrative way of sculpting. In high relief sculpture, more than 50% of the modeled form projects from the surface. This is an example of a high relief sculpture from Robert Longo. It's titled Corporate Wars, Wall of Influence. This is the middle portion from 1982. If you notice, many of the limbs, the arms, the hands, they protrude much more from the surface than a low relief sculpture would. This allows you basically almost access around. You could reach underneath some of the arms and even insert your hands through them.
You can obviously see through this sculpture that even almost 30 years ago, there was quite a struggle with accepting the corporate lifestyle. So we've seen a few general examples of sculpture. We'll now investigate a little further and start talking about the methods and their accompanying materials. The first method we'll be going over is modeling. It is a manipulative and often additive process. Pliable materials such as clay, wax, or plaster is built up, removed, and pushed into a final form. This ceramic sculpture is an example of additive modeling. This sculpture is additive because the original sculptor started off with small pieces of clay and formed them into shapes that will eventually resemble the human form and whatever other pieces that the sculptor intended being on it. This being a ceramic sculpture means that it was made from clay earthenware and was fired in a kiln. After it was done firing, it was painted by hand. In general, ceramics are clays, the different variations thereof, all do have some weight and substance to them. So if you're working outside of the vessel form in general, the things that you might be spinning on a wheel, wind up having to be supported somehow, and usually you have something called an armature that winds up supporting the structure, and it in general helps to prevent sagging. Viola Frey, here in Stubborn Woman, Orange Hands, from 2004, had to use an armature to support the work. Also, she had to split it up into different sections to fire them separately. This is a very large piece. Here's another example of modeled earthenware ceramic sculpture. It is by artist Ken Price, titled Vink, from 2009. Now this is very different than the first two sculptures we looked at more in representation that this is an abstract form. The other two uh, sculptures we looked at were based off of human forms. But the other difference is that this was not glazed, which is a uh, paint that's made of fine glass particles uh, of certain colors. It's painted on with a liquid onto the surface of a sculpture and then fired so it's enameled to the surface. It becomes glass, it melts, becomes very hard. This is done with acrylic paint, layered, and then sanded. The next sculptural method we'll be discussing is casting. Now the explanation is rather lengthy to do in writing, but essentially what happens is either an object or a sculpted form has to have a mold made of it for step one. So if you make something out of clay, you're going to take plaster, splatter it on the top so that there are no air holes, and um, it takes roughly about a half an hour for the plaster to start hardening. Now, uh, before you even add the plaster, you have to put these little shims around it to split your plaster open once it hardens. Once you are done with the plaster and the mold is hardened and complete, you can crack it open. You would take the clay interior out and you have to clean it up on the inside. At that point, you have to reseal the mold that was made. Usually uh, what happens at this point is once it's resealed, a sculptor will pour some wax on the inside. Now this is called a lost wax process. There are a few other methods of mold making as well, but in general, 90% uh, of them do get made this way. Once the uh, wax is poured inside, of course it has to be heated first. It'll form inside the mold exactly as the clay had looked. Now what you can do if you have several components that you've sculpted, you can do the mold separate and then combine them in the wax phase so that you can put them in uh, one mold together. Now if you're using resin, it's not a bad idea to cast everything separately because you can usually melt the things together afterwards in more of a simple fashion before you paint it and join all of the uh, components. But with Doing it the uh, with bronze and other metals, you'll basically make a sand and plaster mixture mold, meaning that you put your full wax sculpture inside. You don't have to put any shims to separate it. Once you do that, you also have to attach things that are called sprues 
on the wax that allows once it's melted out in a kiln out of the plaster and sand mold that it allows for access for the metal to be poured in that's why it's called lost wax the loss is melted out and then you go ahead and replace the um, the interior with bronze these can weigh extremely large amounts of uh, weight but uh, the two examples we've looked at so far were from the beginning of the lesson we've got a sculpture from Giacometti on the left a man pointing a bronze sculpture and the one on the right is a dancing Krishna this slide is the example of the casting process that was included in your text I decided to leave my previous explanation that you just heard of casting because it reflects my experience in casting and probably what you would come across in the university environment with taking a sculpture class what you see in this example of the casting process is something that's probably related much more to traditional uh, casting meaning that those in the past may have used this so when you see a clay core and then the wax attached to it people like me and many others actually make their things in clay first make a mold to enable themselves to make a wax out of that so this is a little bit different than my experience so to say also if you see there's uh, wax rods that's actually sprues they're called drains here so all of us have the same knowledge but a little bit different explanation as to the actual definitions of what those are so uh, if you use the term wax rods and sprues they're going to be known as the same thing also using the layer of clay is a little bit more on the inconvenient side for the common co uh, college student meaning that the plaster is cheap for you to work with clay is pretty expensive and this little outer layer of clay and layer of fine sand is something that's actually used in people that practice the tradition that's been around for thousands of years of casting not necessarily on the modern conditions like I explained in the previous slide casting can be used for very small sculptures and very large sculptures as we see in this slide from Charles Ray it's titled father figure from 2007 a giant sculpture made out of painted steel that resembles the old style plastic and metal toys from the 1940s and 50s of the standard American tractor and the farm worker on it now when we look in modern terms of doing things an artist is probably going to tend to lean towards the older tradition of manufacturing an object like this some modern artists also will choose to use a 3d program to uh, design a specific sculpture and we do have 3d printers and other things that can manufacture uh, large-scale sculptures as well this is an interesting example of sculpture where art imitates life so to say it's from Kaz Ashiro its tailgate from 2006 Ashiro recreated the tailgate of a Toyota pickup truck by using a wooden frame or armature canvas acrylic paint and Bondo which is actually used in the repairing of trucks and other things made of metal also on boats and such the artist Rachel Whiteread who made this untitled piece Hive One is actually known for translating empty spaces into some type of physical form so she has taken giant water towers and filled them with polyvinyl resin to actually fill up the empty space that you kind of take for granted so this is the same type of process on something quite a bit smaller but the inside of a beehive that's been cast to represent the empty space inside you don't have these outer walls the next sculptural method is carving in carving you carve away unwanted material to form a sculpture this is a subtractive process this slide is an example of carved marble sculpture by Renaissance artist Michelangelo titled Awakening Slave this is one of four unfinished marble sculptures of slaves that he had left behind a artist working with marble and carving essentially uses a 
hammer and chisel to delicately carve away the details that he wants to reveal in the sculpture. Michelangelo was kind of a superstar in his lifetime. There's a lot written during his life uh, and even by him about his intentions behind his sculptures and one thing he famously said was that he was attempting to release the figure from the stone. It probably could be said that carving is inherent in the human condition because the history associated with our earliest ancestors carving objects from the earliest primitive hunting tools uh, to simple uh, devices that you would use for eating at home. Now, uh, what we have here is roughly about 2,000 years old from the Western Han Dynasty, China. It's a disc carved in nephrite, which is a type of jade. Now, the procedures that are usually used with this are fine blades, and in particular with this one, drills and uh, quartz sand were used to finely carve this object. The little bumpy surfaces that are very mathematically uh, separated, if you see on the uh, disc shape itself, are called bosses. Wood, of course, is much easier to manipulate than stone. We have a carved walnut wood sculpture by Elizabeth Catlett here, Mother and Child number 2 from 1971. We looked at Elizabeth Catlett when we were going over printmaking. She does linoleum and woodcut prints. Similar process, actually. You can sand, cut, and scoop with various different tools. You can also engrave and burn into wood. Uh, if you look closely at the hand that's not on top of the head, the one that's covering the breast area underneath the child, is in relief carved into the surface of the wood. In this slide, we have another example of Martin Purier's work titled Hominid, made of pine. This is a freestanding sculpture, just like the one we looked at at the beginning of this lesson. Purier is gone over a little bit more extensively than some of the other artists in our texts in the forming art section of the sculpture lesson. The next sculptural method we'll be going over is constructing and assembling. In this slide we have two examples of constructed and assembled sculpture. They are both by the same artist, Julio Gonzalez. On the left we have Maternity from 1934 and on the right we have the Montserrat from 1936-1937 range. Both sculptures are made of welded iron the one on the right sheet iron and the one on the left is different uh, shapes of iron rods and such that have been welded and formed and cut and shaped. The Montserrat on the right is made of welded sheet iron meaning that the iron was shaped and formed and welded together. Gonzalez had gained an interest in welding after briefly working at a automobile factory and he also assisted Pablo Picasso in his uh, metal sculpture work. This slide is of a horse made of found steel that has been welded together. The artist is Deborah Butterfield. The title of the work is Conyer from 2007. Deborah Butterfield is known for making these found object horses. She's been doing them since the 70s. They um, always uh, have an element of playfulness to them. In a sense, they are representational because you can identify them as a horse, but they're always made of components that you just wouldn't associate normally with horses. Butterfield has a ranch in Montana where she spends a lot of time around horses, so that's where the obsession with making them for so long it comes from. We just looked at three previous images that were constructed in some way using a welding torch to bond the items together and the artist would come up with some type of way to uh, shape their uh, either steel or iron that they were using. Assemblage is a little bit different in a sense that the artist usually finds an object and leaves it fairly intact in the way that it is and just by some type of epiphany these two objects go together as we have here with the bull's head from Pablo Picasso from 1943. This has always been one of my favorite pieces just because it's 
when you think about Pablo Picasso, he's from Spain. One of the national identities of Spain is the bull. He has bulls in many of his paintings. The fact that he could look into a pile of junk and take a broken bicycle and just assemble it into something metaphorical like this, I find very fascinating about the artistic mind at work. All assemblage isn't made of metal as we've seen in our examples so far. Here we have a work by Mark Andre Robinson. This is the throne for the greatest rapper of all time from 2005. Robinson shops thrift stores and finds furniture components to reshape into new things that basically it wasn't originally intended for. Our next sculptural method is kinetic sculpture. Kinetic sculpture is sculpture that moves. It can either be powered by natural elements like water or wind, or it can be powered by some type of electrical power. The artist who started the revolution that was kinetic sculpture movement brought to sculpture was Alexander Calder. This is a massive, almost 30-foot mobile. It's untitled. It's from 1976. Calder actually invented the mobile in the um, 1920s and continued working uh, all the way until the end of his life uh, making these wonderful uh, objects. They change in position and their relationships in space by the airflow in the interior of this building. Jesus Rafael Soto in Hurtado writing from 1975 had a different approach to kinetic sculpture. There's a painted background with thin vertical lines in front of it. He has suspended curvy wires that slowly sway in front and change the position and the relationship to the lines uh, behind them that are on the painted surface. Very slow, sometimes imperceptible, much more delicate than the mobile. Mixed media can apply to many different types of artwork and it can also apply to sculpture. It is using a variety of media in a single work. In mixed media sculpture you can feel comfortable using pretty much about anything as you can see in this work. It's titled Inopportune Stage 1 from 2004. It's in the uh, Seattle Art Museum. We have automobiles, nine of them, suspended in air with various light tubes of uh, different sizes poking in and out of them. They're symbolically supposed to either represent explosions from action movies or on the more unfortunate side explosions from car bombers in a uh, war type situation. So can be interpreted in either way but it's a little bit of an homage to uh, action films. There can be a certain amount of assemblage to certain mixed media works as you can see here this is a work by Lara Schnitger it's Grim Boy from 2005 this is a mixture of beads and fur and clothing fabric other things on a structure meant to mimic a uh, form of some sort a lurking figure so to say this work also qualifies as mixed media it's a little less assemblage out of odd unfamiliar objects as the previous works we just looked at but this is made from a carved floral form uh, the figures are uh, placed in unusual manner we have one on the top actually on the outside of the pedestal area and then we have one upside down in the interior this is by uh, Matthew Monahan it's the seller and the sold from 2006 so mixed media can be also just the unusual materials that are used that may be used out of context to what they're normally um, considered for, but the artist has found a way to manipulate them to their own purposes. The last sculptural method we'll be looking at is installations. An installation artist transforms a space by bringing into it items of symbolic significance. So, leave it to an artist to take the sometimes simple and yet mysterious act of taking a glass and listening to perhaps what might be going on the other side of a wall and creating an art installation out of this. Remember, an installation is where an artist transforms a space. This literally can be installed anywhere that is interested in having
Amelia Pike's work. This is titled Eavesdropping from 2011. In the previous slide, I mentioned that certain installations are designed in a way that they can be reformatted depending on the space that they're in. So the artist isn't hung up on a particular area that it needs to be in. It can be reformatted for any uh, space if possible. For the example that we're looking at right now, which is from Richard Serra, it's Tilted Arc from 1981. This was commissioned by the government and was designed to specifically go into this space it became basically an eyesore to the uh, surrounding community the people that were working in the office buildings would have to walk around it it definitely blocked your view as well it eventually uh, had complaints that it became a homeless shelter it started getting graffiti all over it the government decided to relocate the work and Richard Serra decided to sue he eventually lost his lawsuit and they moved the uh, sculpture, but he certainly wasn't very happy because he said it was designed for this particular space. In this slide we have a, another example of a site-specific work. This is from Olaf Eliasson, The Weather Project, from the Unilever series from 2003. The Tate Modern in London had acquired a large vacant space and it used it for temporary installations such as this. A museum such as the Tate will commission an artist to do something like this. Since the work can't be sold, the artist is paid a certain amount of money to basically commit to this project and see it through. The way the illusion here is created of a sun that's not actually a complete circle it's a semicircle of bright lamps and on the ceiling above it right at about the halfway point are mirrors to give it the illusion that the circle is complete if you look on the ceiling you can actually see reflections of some of the people walking below in a way this is also very interesting for installations that it generated some heat and you'll get that sensation as well this is the last example in our lecture on sculpture. Thank you very much for listening.